was who took a monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was on the square. The buzzer tried to throw the monkey off of his back, but the monkey grabbed his neck and said, Now listen, Jack. Straighten up and fly Welcome right. to today's podcast. Straighten up and fly My name is Benjamin Alida Sainz, coming you coming to you from Studio J. That's J E Juan and Eloisa, named for the good people who had the good sense to have me as a son. God bless them. May they rest in peace. We're coming to you from Amos Corner in El Paso, Texas. The podcast? Hey, maybe I get applause this time. This is the name of my podcast. Don't be so off the wall. Straighten up and fly right. <laughs> we have with us on today's podcast, Jose de Pirola, who comes to us via El Peru. He um, teaches at Creative Writing at the University of Texas at El Paso. He's an incredible writer, an incredible teacher. And today, we're going to hear his story about how he came to be a writer. It's certainly worth listening to. Welcome to the show, Jose. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the invitation and also for the kind words. Okay, so Jose's really a good guy. Um, so I'm going to start off with a poem, and then after my poem, I'm going to have Jose read one of, the, one of the little stories that he has in his new book entitled Fabulations. Prayer for George. The sky is clear as gin. I could lay my body down, sleep in the calm night, the peace of the winter wind and the deep black sky that makes me forget, makes me remember. Now I see the stars. A million tongues of fire, I am so small. The earth beneath my feet is giving, strong but slowly, slowly dying. Tonight, I want, there has to be a God. Beautiful. So, Jose, um, tell us a little bit about your book and why don't you read us one of the, the selections from it. Yeah, uh, the book is called Fabulations. Um, it's available through Amazon. And if you're in El Paso, please uh, go and support Literarity, which is a bookstore that um, carries it. Um, it's a book of, I would not call it short stories, but it's a book of fabulations. And in the book, I'm attempting to create a genre, which is a mix of fable, history, and fiction, as if you can see in the pieces. Uh, at the same time, uh, I was attempting to create something like um, a world that is self-contained, yet not complete. That was humbly my attempt when I wrote the book. Well, what I could do in into that is because um, uh, is uh, the traditional folk tales that you were uh, that you, th th this new, did that kind of um, help you along this way? Um, oh, absolutely, yeah, because uh, the years before I was working on, I was doing translations, and one of the translations I did was from um, Jose Maria Arguedas, which is a, a very well-known Peruvian writer. And uh, he um, collected traditional folk tales in Quichua, which is a language uh, he grew up with. And then he translated those into Spanish. And I did a translation into English. So I've, I realized that there is a lot of cultural heritage and a lot of knowledge that is passed through um, via these traditional folk tales. And I remember that when I was a kid, um, one of the books that impressed me the most when I was seven or eight were Aesop's Fables. But they, they just remain in my mind. And uh, I realized, well, maybe there's a way to update the form of the fable to the 21st century. And of course, we had to steer away from the pure moralistic um, right. bent of the original tales. Uh, so rather using the form to explore ideas that are concerning us now and that have been concerning us for a while. So they're fabulations that ostensibly they sound that, that they may be for children, but they're actually for adults. They're for adults, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. As, as the original, um, uh, um, a lot of the, the fairy tales that we know as fairy tales were not really written for children. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the originals are um, pretty bloody. Sometimes. They're pretty gruesome. <laughs> Um, so, Jose, now I know your story of how you got to be a writer, and I think when, I don't know how you came about telling me this story, but 
maybe we were out and we were out for a drink or we were talking and you told me this this whole story of because I wanted to know uh, I knew that you had been in business before and though and when you came to apply for a job at UTEP in 2007 yes um, I, I remember knowing that you had that business background but you wouldn't have known it because you were such an such an intellectual and I mean that as a and as a compliment, and Thank you. you were so knowledgeable and you were so focused and your answers were so erudite. And I remember thinking, um, wow, this guy makes me feel a little bit like a non-intellectual. <laughs> uh, so I was very impressed. And then when you told me the story, so you came here, when, when did you come to the United States? I came to the U.S. in the year 1990. 1990, and you were following your girlfriend. Yes. Uh, what happened is that, uh, you know, I always wanted to write, and um, my older brother, which is about 13 years older, uh, he's a writer too. So when I was a teenager, uh, as a rebellious teenager, I didn't want to look as if I'm just following his footsteps. I wanted to do something radically different, which was very interesting. Uh, so I chose engineering. I uh, did an undergrad in engineering. And right after, I couldn't really work on the uh, field I chose, which was civil engineering, uh, because it involved a lot of you know, moral issues that I was not really um, happy with. So I, start, uh, I started a few business. So I had a few startups. And there was a moment when the, one of the startups was really working. It was the first time that we were exporting technology from Peru, from a third world country, into the U.S. But then we have uh, this huge inflation. Uh, it was 6,000% uh, uh, the year 1989. So we had 6,000%? 6,000%, yeah. So you, you couldn't use the currency, essentially. So we lost a lot of clients. We had to close the business. And at that moment, it's, it's like Destiny was trying to, uh, you know, give me a hint. Uh, this is not for you. <laughs> at that moment, I had a girlfriend who was uh, already in California. And I was, you know, at that moment, I, w I, I would confess that I was a little afraid to uh, embrace what I really wanted to do, which is to be a writer. Are we deeply in love? Yeah, and also, you know, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> so a combination of those two feelings brought me to California, thinking that, well, um, I'm just going to uh, try to find a job, and then I'll see, I'll figure out how do I become the writer I want to be. That was a, the fuzzy, completely unrealistic plan. And it was uh, unrealistic because I didn't speak English at all. <laughs> so that was the, the first hurdle. Uh, and it was completely fuzzy because I didn't really understand what it meant to be a writer. But, uh, but, uh, and, um, how old were you at that time? I was 30. You were what? 30. You were 30. Yes. So for, uh, for all the standards, you know, <laughs> I hadn't even begun writing and I was an old man. You know? I, was, I began taking classes in creative writing when I was 30. Yeah. So... Um, I, the, I was obviously faced with the challenge of not having, uh, you know, um, legal status, not speaking the language, and needing to make a living like uh, most immigrants. So I, I started working in whatever I could. Um, one of the, the most stable jobs I had was in a basement where I had to do data entry um, for about seven, eight hours a day, sometimes ten hours a day. So it, that job was sort of killing my spirit, but I, I managed to... You know, um, sneak in a few minutes in the bathroom of reading and just uh, sometimes I just step out just to look at the sky uh, to, to be able to, to survive that. But, you know, when you're in that kind of situation, and, and that's really humbling because your goals um, uh, shift, right? My goal at that moment was I need to make a living. I need to survive here. I need to acquire the skills so I can really make, a, make it in the U.S. And were you learning English at the time? Exactly. One of the skills was to learn English, but obviously not in a very structured way. I just learned the very basics. At the, uh, at did that did your girlfriend speak English? Yeah, she did. She did, yeah. I, I remember many instances in which we were going out shopping and I had to turn around and ask her in Spanish, please ask him to show me this or ask them if they have this or that, right? I was completely uh, unable to communicate uh, at that moment. So there was, uh, um, I was, and I, I, I can say that I, I've been absolutely lucky throughout my life. Um, I don't know 
uh, how to express it otherwise. Um, because there was a moment in which I was um, at the end of the rope, so to speak, and uh, and uh, one day I went to this basement and I couldn't really work the eight hours that I, I had to. So I just walk out. I have half the day. It was 10 in the morning and I just walk out. And I told my girlfriend, which was my wife at that moment, uh, you know, I, I cannot stand doing that work anymore. I'm going to find something. And in my desperation, I found a um, um, magazine, a Time magazine, uh, which had an article about how to get a um, work visa if you had a skill like engineering. So I wrote this lawyer in, in New York uh, with my wife's help. And um, then um, the, the lawyer replied, and I went through the process. And I was lucky enough to be hired in a company in Los Angeles as a computer programmer. So that was my first job that I really was making money, and it was a good job. And it, right? it was legal. You could be. It was legal. Uh, so finally, I, I stepped into that direction. I was completely happy with that at that moment. And your English, and uh, you spoke English my at that English, point. English, not completely. I was. I had improved enough to communicate. Right. Um, I would not. I would not say that um, I would have been able to have this kind of conversation back then. But uh, it, it was enough to understand. Sometimes I had to ask people to repeat things. But you know, um, the, the the basis of my job was dealing with the computers. So I stay in that in that job for about um, uh, six years. Um, and um, and uh, the the issue is that it, it, I, again, destiny is very strange because every time I felt that uh, I I don't want to do this anymore. I want to write. Uh, they would just give me a promotion. <laughs> uh, and so like testing me, right? <laughs> uh, and another promotion, another promotion. And one day, I, I was the vice president of the company. They gave me the corner office uh, and, and so on and so forth. With a view? With a view, yeah. I had a fantastic view of downtown Los Angeles in the 18th floor of this skyscraper. And, and at that moment, uh, you know, I realized, you know, this is not really what I want to do. This, this, this is my life, you know. Uh, and I was uh, already 37. <laughs> and I said, if, if I continue this, if I accept this promotion, then um, that's the life I, I'm choosing. Um, and it was very difficult, right? Because I, I was 37. I, I had a, an enviable position uh, as an immigrant who didn't speak English at the beginning. Um, but the one thing that always kept coming back to me is that I would just, even when I was going through this process of being promoted, I would just sneak out uh, um, a lunch or you know a, a little moment in the, in the morning to go and read, to go to a bookstore, uh, to just be with what was my passion. I mean, and there was a moment. Uh, it was like almost like an addiction. <laughs> I wanted to have my fix somehow. And there were some times in which I was working, you know, solidly for two or three days. And the fourth day, when I went, I was just driving to my office, I felt, um, I don't want to be there. I want to be up, um, um, surrounded by books. So I would just call my assistant and said, you know, um, I'm sick today. I'm not going to go to work. And I just made a beeline for the public library. <laughs> and I just, exactly as I was, I just spent the whole day in the public library reading and it was, you know, obvious that there was um, um, something that I had unresolved. So that was a, a very difficult decision. It was as hard as deciding to come to the U.S., uh, the decision of just leaving, working out of that job and starting from scratch. So, and I was, and I say I was absolutely lucky because back at that moment I had uh, divorced my first wife and I had met Christine which is one of the most wonderful people <laughs> in the planet. And um, she was so supportive of my idea of being a writer. Everybody, I told, everybody, uh, I told. But she's an artist. She's an artist. So she understands. Yeah. Everybody I told about this plan, I'm going to quit my corporate job <laughs> to be a writer. Nobody said, do it. The only two people that, that agreed completely were my mom. She said, if that's what you want to do, do it. And Christine, my wife. 
So I just quit, and we went back to Peru, and I spent, I gave myself um, one year fellowship with my savings, and I was just, essentially was trying to write. I didn't know anything um, about writing, about not, you know, I, I was familiar with literature. I loved literature. I'd been reading literature for a long time, but I didn't know how to write, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was like um, a race car driver that doesn't know how the engine works, <laughs> right? So um, when we came back to the U.S., um, we uh, she was about to start um, a master's in Latin American studies, and I realized, you know, oh, that... That's what I need to do. But um, unfortunately, at that moment, there were no MFAs in Spanish. Mm. And my English was not um, enough at that moment to pursue an MFA in English. So what was the next best, best thing was to pursue um, a, a PhD in Latin American studies or in Latin American literature, which is what I did. Uh, it was a very bold, bold move because I didn't have any undergrad um, coursework in literature, um, so I didn't have any accreditation in literature. So I, the, I remember that I, I, with the help of my wife uh, Christine, um, I spent hours trying to get a good writing sample, a good convincing uh, statement of purpose, so I'll be considered, and I was accepted. I was absolutely lucky because. I've seen applications, and in that same university, I've seen applications that were not as uh, you know weak as mine that uh, got rejected. <laughs> so it was a complete lag, and I was in the program. And <coughs> while I was I was uh, pursuing um, the the PhD, um, I learned ab uh, about writing in the in the two things that you have to learn. Uh, what is the craft, right, that you need to have some craft, but also what is the lifestyle that you need to be a writer? Because writing is a vocation, right? Writing is not it a is hobby. The, it is the vocation. Yeah, so it's something that is deep in your, in your core. It's something that guides your life and decides your life in, in a number of ways. So one thing I, I did, I, I learned, was the discipline of writing every morning. <coughs> and, uh, I, you know, you've been a student, too. And when you are uh, a grad student, you are supposed to do your coursework. You are supposed to teach for the university. And then uh, I had to also find time for my own writing. So I, I was able to create this, such a schedule that I was um, um, able to to keep writing throughout the five how much years. sleep did you get uh th th that was a, the sad part of the equation probably between um, four and six hours every day uh, sometimes a little less than that uh, i remember <laughs> <laughs> but but i ha i was so stubborn because i knew that if i don't get up at six in the morning and write until nine the rest of the day is going to be teaching, doing coursework, going to my classes, writing my papers, and I'm not going to write. So I had to do it every day. Every day I woke up early in the morning. And I was absolutely lucky because I, I was, my writing, um, I hope that has improved over time. I'm sorry. But um, my writing was not that great. Uh, however, I, I was able to publish early on. I won some <laughs> awards, and uh, in Peru, there are a few at, at the moment that were the most important awards, and I was able to um, win at least um, um, four of the five, you know. Uh, That's not luck, Jose. Oh. <laughs> That's <laughs> talent. It's called talent. <laughs> so it was, it was at the very, uh, you know, um, at the very least, it was uh, an encouragement. Uh, it was, again, like Destiny saying, you know, you're going the right, right way. Just keep walking. You've chosen the right path. Just keep going. All right? So that's, um, uh, in a way, um, the moment when I realized this is what I want to do. But there is still another, another moment of, of decision. Uh, because when you do um, a PhD in literature in the US, uh, what you're doing is you're getting ready to become an academician. Right. And, um, um, a professor at a university teaching literature. Right. That was my training, right? 
So when I finished uh, um, my um, PhD, I was obviously looking for such a job. And I thought, well, I'm going to teach literature, which I love, and I'm going to write um, fiction, too. And I'll try to combine both things. I've done it before through the PhD, so I can keep doing it. And I remember we're sitting with Christine one day uh, in this you know, uh, pr moment and in this process, and I said, um, wouldn't it be amazing if I could teach creative writing in the US? And not only that, I said, you know, if I could teach in English and Spanish, because I felt confident enough to, to teach in English back then, not to write in English. So, um, and she said, yeah, that will be, that will be crazy, right? It was just like a pipe dream. <laughs> Let me interrupt you right now. You're, your, your writing in English is fabulous, oh, by the way. So, thank you. So that's really humble of you to say, oh, I can't write in English. Of course <laughs> you can. And, and you do so beautifully. Thank you. Uh, so at, at that moment, you know, that was a, the dream. And when I was looking for jobs, there was this job at YouTube, and I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, look, Christine, this is perfect. This is exactly the job. Obviously, they are not going to call me, <laughs> but I'm going to apply anyway. <laughs> So um, I applied to a number of jobs, and the two that actually I liked were uh, one in Oregon, a um, small university, beautiful place. They were uh, absolutely, um, um, you know, friendly, <coughs> and they were um, ready to accept my fiction as part of my publications. Uh, but the, the only problem was that I wouldn't be teaching literature there. And then I got the offer at UTIP, in which I will be teaching creative writing. So it was you know, difficult to, to balance, but obviously I was lucky enough to be offered this, this job, which I think is um, amazing uh, in terms of what it offers you as a writer, as a human being, considering where we are located, and uh, also th the chance to keep writing and keep working with literature in the way I really loved. That's amazing. <laughs> that, <coughs> it's really amazing how th that happens because obviously you were meant to be a writer. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I sometimes, you know, um, people say, well, it was meant to be. And then sometimes they say, oh, I don't know, you know, you know. But in, in, in your instance, it just seems like it was meant to be. This, that you were supposed to be a writer, that you needed to be a writer, Thank that you. you had to be a writer. And my story isn't like as interesting as yours, but I, I did. I only applied for one job. I wasn't on the job market. I was like you. I was. Um, I published two books um, in poetry. I'd gotten a Stegner Fellowship at Stanford, and I'd been there for two years working with Denise Levertov, who became my friend, and she was and my mentor, and she was obviously a very famous American poet. And so I published a book of poems that won an American Book Award, and I published a book of short stories, but there wasn't. Even then, I thought, like, well, what do I do? I, I hadn't been on the job market, so I was in the PhD program at Stanford. And I thought, well, well hell, you know, I said to myself, <laughs> I'm going to get a job teaching at some <laughs> Midwest university that wants a Hispanic, <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> to live and die there, and oh, shit. <laughs> but there was a job at UTEP, and, right. and, they, and they asked so, so someone to... Preferably, it wasn't necessary, but preferably bilingual, mm -hmm. because they were going to start a bilingual MFA program eventually. And I, uh, I wasn't on the job market. I had just started to do my course, to, fin to start the process to do my dissertation. But I applied for the job, <coughs> and I didn't think they'd give it to me, because I'd gotten my master's here. <coughs> mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had my colleagues as professors some of whom didn't like me, and some of whom I didn't like. <laughs> so I thought, mm, no. But I got the job, and it was like... Um, and they were wise to have you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I came here, and I was thrilled. But like, but like you, when you say that no one was supportive of the idea of you becoming a writer, there was not one mentor I had at Stanford that supported the idea of me taking a job at the University of Texas at El Paso. Because they said, man, you're better than that. You can do better than that. Um, on and on and on. And, and they didn't know that they were insulting me. Because in a sense, it was a little racist. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you want to go teach a bunch of Mexicans? Mm -hmm. Well, I am one. Hello. Um, so, And I didn't really think about 
and I don't know if this crossed your mind, that I didn't need to teach at a prestigious university um, t for my writing. Exactly. Uh, you know, you know if, if you teach at um, one of the top 10 schools in creative writing, they don't write your books for you. And I thought that this place was going to feed my writing, living here. Uh, it wasn't so much UTEP, it was the border. And I knew that if I could just live, stay living on the border, I would write all of the things I needed to write. And, and you I was, write, uh, you've written wonderful things. And I really love, and I, and I think that I think n my inspiration for my writing has been the border. And so, um, but it was, if I hadn't got that job, I think, I don't know what I'd done. I, I didn't get the job. And I, but I did, and so I think I was, I was meant to come here. Um, so, but at that moment, you were about to start writing your dissertation. I was about to start writing my so dissertation. So, was it difficult to decide between getting the job and uh, leaving your, your dissertation unfinished? That wasn't difficult at all. I just <laughs> I don't want to write a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a pain in the ass. It's like you, you spend the three years of your life doing research for, um, of course, I, I, I knew what I wanted to do my dissertation on, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't have taken me as long because it was, it was a straight... Um, um, old-fashioned kind of um, um, research paper. Um, the, um, the the Daily Worker, which was the communist newspaper, mm -hmm. they published poems and stories mm -hmm. in, in their newspapers at, 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 all the time. And so I was going to take the collection uh, of the um, Daily Worker. Um, and, of course, who, who has a full collection of the Daily Worker? A, a right-wing think tank at Stanford called the... Um, what was it called? The... Um, I forget the name of the. Uh, they they have a, a think tank and mm -hmm. and so they collect all these left wing literature and they they had a full collection and I had written a paper on it on one issue, and you know a cultural kind of criticism uh, and where I found this poem and that's what I was going to do and so I was just going to get in there, and take all the poetry out and write a long long kind of um, introduction to it and mm -hmm. then publish it at, at, in like three or four parts. Mm -hmm. So that, I was really focused, but still I didn't, you know what, it still hasn't been done. Someone should do it. Yeah. Um, so your, your interest was in poetry as a social uh, function. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, because I, you know, there was always this kind of, I don't know if it was, has been for you, but that someone said, you're either going to be, is your poetry, are you going to choose Poetry or politics? Which one is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I didn't think you really had to choose. Um, I think that sometimes there's there's a lot of bad political poetry out there, <laughs> but it's not bad because it's political. It's bad because they don't stick to their crafts because they don't they forget they're writing a poem. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 not a treatise. It's a poem. So they don't want they don't make it into a poem. And they don't use the discipline of their art to to say that whatever mm -hmm. they want to say, and um, so I never felt I had to make a choice. Um, though often I had poetry professors that told me I did. Then it was a testament to the fact that I was writing very bad poetry. It, it wasn't my politics wasn't the issue, uh, but the poem should be the issue when you're writing a poem. It's a poem, yeah. uh, and I and I'm very you know um, it's very important to me, and I didn't think I had to choose um and i think it's, it's made my my poetry has tempered my politics in the sense that um any politics whatever if you're engaged in it can be um very it can be mean it can lack compassion it can um, st uh, um make you stop listening to other people because you're so convinced that you're right and the craft of poetry and the art of being a, a writer has taught me that um um, not to believe everything I think. Exactly. Uh, you you have. I mean, in the, in your day to day life, you can have opinions of a partisan, but when you are writing, you cannot. You have to hold every opinion, like you say, even your own, up to scrutiny, and also be faithful to what you are doing, what you are writing. Right. Be faithful to your characters, to the, to your story, or to your poem, uh, which is which is going to embody your politics, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> you know, like, like, I don't really, I think I speak out of a space that I can't be anything but a gay man. I can't be anything but a Mexican-American uh, who grew up on that border. And I think that my work, whatever it is, is imbued with that. And I think that, that um, to, to teach me that 
I don't write Latino novels, whatever that is. I don't write gay novels. I don't write gay poetry. I, I don't do that. I write because I am those things. I just normalize all that experience, mm -hmm. like any, anybody else. I'm. They're just normal characters. I don't. I don't write about being gay. I don't write about being Mexican American. They're just Mexican Americans. Or they're just. They're just people. Mm -hmm. And I write out of that. And so it, it doesn't become about. It's not about those things. It, be, it becomes about the daily struggles that all human beings have. Of who are they? What do they want to do? And how do they fuck up? I mean, they, all the time, and they want to be good people. And you know, and there's a voice in them that says, like every good novel, you know, the main character, and you're a reader, and you're telling them. Don't do it. Don't <laughs> do it. And they do it. You go, oh, no. shit, you did it. And then they, their lives are all screwed up now. And you think, oh, no. Um, but it's that kind of humanity that we have to imbue our, imbue our literature with. And I think that you do that. Uh, and and it, what's interesting about your work is that you know, you, you know immediately it's not written by an American. Which, no, is, which is great. <laughs> which is great. You don't have to say anything. Yeah. Um, it just, you just write out of that space and you do so naturally and humanely. And I think that's really um, incredible. And the kind of discipline you had to have to become the, the writer that you are. So what was, what was to you the hardest thing when you, given your situation and all the things you had to do, um, from coming to a new country to learning a new language to you know being successful in a field that you abandoned and then starting from scratch again to finally landing a job and teaching what was the, what is the hardest thing for you sometimes to just grapple with as a as a teacher as a teacher um, I think that the, the most difficult thing sometimes is um, that S some students, I mean, we have wonderful students in, in YouTube, but I was a student once, and I also um, didn't realize how difficult it is to write, how much dedication you need to write, and how much of a um, life decision it is to be a writer or a poem. It is, uh, in my view, and, and I going back to what you said, um, I was not interested in teaching in, in a big university. I was interested in teaching in a university where I could contribute to, to uh, the lives and the development of students, but also where I could grow as a writer. Because it, it is about making a decision that is going to affect the rest of your life. So sometimes, some students are um, more uh, attached to the idea of being a writer than actually being the, one. The idea of writing, right? right. So you, you want to be a writer in the future who has had success or has won awards and whatever. That's that's sometimes what you are attached to. I, I myself, I had that that feeling at the beginning, but there's a moment in which. Um, you switch and you realize my writing is my life. My writing every day is my life. That's, that's what uh, being a writer uh, is, is meant to be. And it, it is work. And, and sometimes you tell your students um, that it's work. And sometimes they don't believe you, and especially when I get very romantic uh, students in my undergraduate classes and their creative writing you know, um, majors and they're, they're gifted. They are and they're smart and, and you know. So, and then I tell them, you know what you want me, I, especially if they're seniors already and they're getting about to graduate, I know what you want me to tell you. You want me, you want to turn in your first assignment, you want to give it to me, and you want me to walk in here and tell you, 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 you are the real thing. <laughs> um, that's what you want me to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you that. Yeah. Because this is about work. Whatever t talent you have, um, you know, that is given to you as a gift. Maybe you didn't earn it, and it was just there. It was, it was a gift from somewhere, the universe. But if you don't do anything with it, um, it, it amounts to nothing. I remember when I was a Stegner Fellow, that I think most of the students there had, were far more gifted than I was. I was the hardest working because well, I wanted it, and, and they didn't, obviously, because they were given two years to write and didn't do a damn thing. And so, like, it is about that work that is not romantic. It's... it's there's nothing, there's nothing, you know, glamorous about sitting in front of a computer six hours a day. Exactly. And, and sometimes, you know, grappling with your own limitations, understanding that what you're uh, trying to accomplish uh, is, is not within your means yet. 
And, 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 and that's a, a wonderful conflict to have, a wonderful <laughs> problem to have, right? That you're trying to attain something that's not quite there, but it's not going to become, or it's not going to come to fruition if you don't put the work, the hard work that requires you know, to, to go over a story or <coughs> a, a novel or even a page, um, sometimes 50 times, 60 times until you see what you want to. I think that's where um, kind of a self-criticism comes. I don't know if you call it humility or self-criticism, but a kind of um, ability to step back and look at your own work and say, you know, this is bloody awful. Um, <laughs> but also to congratulate yourself sometimes. It's bloody awful, but, you know, good for you. You have ambition. The, the story has ambition. You didn't quite pull it off. But, and you have to say that to yourself. You have to become your own best reader. And that takes a lot of... Um, you know, it, it's because you do have to step back and say, um, are you abandoning this project because you're a coward or because you're not up to the task? Mm -hmm. Those are two different things. Um, yeah, and, and the ability to step back and look at your work with critical eyes, it's really difficult to develop, it takes years to develop. And that's uh, something I keep repeating uh, um, to my students, you know, you need to learn that. That's that's uh, while you are in this program, learn that. But I think that somehow, sometimes, a, a, a professor like yourself, they can they can see what you see, and, and they can adopt that for themselves because you can provide that as a model. I remember one thing that um, Denise Devotoff always told me, as, as you know, in this poem, um, you're not following your own script. And this is the. This is the, you have written the, the, the music <laughs> and you have lineated your music, but you're not reading your music and you're not, you're not putting your line breaks where you want them to be the way that I hear you read it. So you have to learn how to do that so that you can read it the way you hear it. Um, and that was really important. Mm -hmm. And that helped me become my own uh, critic. And then, and then the, the other thing is that Simone de Piero was <laughs> a wonderful poet, um, also a great art critic. He's, he used to say, he, didn't, he never complimented you on your work. If you were looking for compliments, you might as well <laughs> pack it up. He doesn't give compliments. But he would say, um, um, if he, if he, he'd say one thing about your poem. If it was finished, um, he'd say, um, if he thought, if he liked the poem, he would say, um, I have nothing to say about your poem. Which is only to tell you that he was finished and that was a big compliment <laughs> if you knew him. But you know, like, you yeah. decided to know him. But, or he would say, mm, this poem, um, well, there's just one line. If he'd read me the line, and he'd say, Ben, you talk real deep like this, Ben, and that line's a little too in love with itself, don't you think? <laughs> and it taught me oh, that, that like, just because you have a, a, a great line doesn't mean you have to ask yourself, this is, this, you know, you, you're, you're so proud of yourself. It's actually what a great line. <laughs> it doesn't belong. <laughs> if it doesn't belong, it doesn't belong. Yeah. Um, and, and to throw it out. Um, and, and it's really difficult sometimes to do that and to, to see that. Because once you see it, it's easy to do it, uh, but absolutely. to see it. And, and one of the things that uh, when you're teaching, uh, and um, I try to teach students uh, to read comments, right? And that's uh, also a, a difficult thing to do uh, because sometimes comments hurt, right? We're human beings. Uh, and, and sometimes you just wanna get rid of the comment and the best way to get rid of the comment is just to implement the comment on, on your piece or just discard it. But right. if you are wise about comments, you try to understand what is the principle behind that comment. Right. That's the learning. No, it's not fixing one line or fixing or, or changing right. the name of a character. It's about the principle behind that. And why is, why is your work uh, creating that comment? That's something that you want to learn. Um, because uh, you, anybody can just take 10 comments and change 10 lines in a, in a short story, but it doesn't mean that you've learned anything. Right. I used to re sometimes, I, I learned to refrain from making a lot of comments on people's poems, and sort of specific ones. I would sometimes say, I circle a line, this is something you, you do very often, this construction and this thing. It's becoming a tick. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to your writing. But I wouldn't put other things like break a line here, none of that. Because when they rewrite their poems at the end of the semester, they just implement what I told them to because I was a teacher and they mm -hmm. pleased me. And that doesn't, that doesn't please me, actually. So then I would, but I would make comments about how their poem didn't, work or did work and what 
I would begin with, this is, I think, what your project is. Mm -hmm. This is what I think we're trying to say. And this is why I think it doesn't work. Um, see, but, but I, but then they could dismiss me if like, no, Ben, you missed it. It's not my project. That's not what I took. Because they could, I put it in a context. Um, but then I had students who would say, um, well, I don't know how to, I don't know how to rewrite my work. You didn't, you didn't say very much. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. We spent an entire class talking about your poem. And I said, plenty. I said, maybe you were absent. <laughs> like it's like they're not listening in the moment to what you're saying about their work mm -hmm. because they disappear or I don't know where but but they think that the comment has to be written mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be but but you give students plenty of time and sometimes I think there is kind of a I mean I guess people feel attacked I'm I don't remember actually if I felt attacked when um when I was a student um if I really felt like, oh man, I'm gonna hang it up. I don't think I ever felt that way. <laughs> but, um, but but it happens in the, in the workshop uh, happens uh, not often, but once in a while, a student really gets hurt really by hurt. the comments. They feel uh, dejected aside. <laughs> and they're walking away sometimes after a night class and I see them walk out. I want to go chase them down and say, yeah. are you going to be all right? Yeah, me too. And I, I just want to say, you know, it's just okay. It's, it's okay to feel bad. I mean, we are humans, right? And you feel bad, but then you're going to learn from that. But find a strategy so you can be human and at the same time grow as a human and as a writer. And, and that happens, you know, if you learn in addition to learning the craft, which is something that we have to do, uh, you learn that writing is a vocation, but also that other people's comments is something you have to learn how to read it too. Right, right. Uh, so do you want to end our interview with, um, with a little reading? Sure, sure. That would be great. Um, and again, uh, I apologize if my reading is not perfect. I um, usually write in Spanish, and I've been re uh, writing in Spanish for, for years since I, I started. But um, one, one thing that, one wonderful challenge about UTIP is that you have in the classroom students who are native English speakers and students that are uh, Spanish native speakers. And I felt completely comfortable giving feedback to Spanish native speakers. But there is still, uh, I was still not comfortable dealing with uh, uh, English speakers. And I, I thought, you know, that's unfair to them. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm sort of shortchanging them in comparison to the, the Spanish speakers. So I um, challenged myself to write in English. And I said, I'm, I'm going to write in English for the next five years. And, and at, that, at the end of those five years, I'm going to... I'm going to make a decision. But uh, Fabulations is the first book I write in English uh, from beginning to end. And uh, it has taught me so much about the language and, and so much uh, to love about English as a language. right? And again, I feel totally fortunate because I feel comfortable in Spanish and I now feel comfortable enough in English to write. Uh, and it's like I'm acquiring another wealth right? besides my, my own language. Uh, my original language. So uh, this uh, story uh, is called um, The Ghost in the Clock, and hopefully it will be apparent what it is about as I read it. He knew it had been accurately, I'm sorry, he knew he had been, uh, again, <laughs> he knew it had been accurate four years ago when the back then priest Ratzinger bought it at a little shop on the corner of Bull's Platz right in front of the three-arched federal place of Bern. The simplicity of the clock had caught Priest Ratzinger's eye. It reminded him of the trains he used to ride after the war when he was a young seminarist, horrified by what transpired about the camps. Those camps, Lord. The minimalist alarm clock, whose splash of color was the red seconds hand, became his constant companion, Croatia, Argentina, Italy, Croatia again, Italy again, and finally the Vatican, awakening him at six in the morning so he could start every day by thanking God for keeping, keeping him alive in the midst of so many wars. In recent years, perhaps due to a tire hairspring or 
a temperamental balance wheel, he had learned about such things. The pin in the dial didn't always fall in the alarm gear at the se set time if the crown wasn't set tight enough. It needed checking every night, the honorary duty conveniently falling onto the Camarlengo, Monsignor Canali, who wasn't fond of old clocks, but somehow had warmed to this one. To the best of his recollection, that particular night, Monsignor Canali had wounded, setting it to six in the morning, making sure the crown was tight enough. He remembers, too, that it had been the case in the past weeks, rather than walking His Holiness to the living room with the large television set, he had a mahogany table with a small screen rolled so His Holiness, comfortably propped by three pillows, could enjoy his evening film. From the options at hand, Monsignor Canali had chosen a film in which a mature Gary Cooper protects his ranch from successive attacks of dark beard, bearded bandits armed with Winchester rifles, bullet belts crossing their chests. Westerns had been a first, not even a second, a choice for Monsignor Canali, who had insisted, I'm sorry, who instead had a soft spot in the most pure way possible for the early Sophia Loren in the films by Vittorio Sica he used to watch with pious eyes when he was still a seminarist. But His Holiness had guided the selection process himself, making it clear that Westerns were his genre, And in the past weeks, no one, not even Monsignor Canali, dare contradict the pontifical wishes. Perhaps His Holiness had been on, I'm sorry, had, perhaps His Holiness uh, was keen on seeing good always vanquishing evil, which seemed to be his concern that night when he asked Monsignor Canali, sitting on a velvet divan on his right, who the god, bad guys were. Monsignor Canali answered with a smile, but a few minutes later, His Holiness asked again, Chi sono i cattivi? When it happened for the first time, Monsignor Canali asked Sister Ildefonsa Frederick, one of the German Benedictine nuns standing by the door, to fetch Dr. Scorza, who arrived within 15 minutes when Monsignor Canali had stopped the movie because His Holiness was breathing with the belabored effort of someone holding the fate of the whole planet in his shoulders. Dr. Escorza wanted to move His Holiness to the Gemelli Polyclinic right away, but His Holiness surprised everyone, including the two Swiss guards ready to push the stretcher when he spoke in his clean, albeit heavily accented Italian, saying that he was feeling better. Sto bene, sto bene. It was an indigestion. He was just in need of some rest. Dr. Scorza insisted on a brief examination, lest his import importance in the staff be doubted, asking His Holiness permission to place the stethoscope on the pontifical arch back. The scene reminded Monsignor Canali somehow of the performers shaping giant soap bubbles he had seen in the streets of London. Dr. Scorza pronounced His Holiness fine. Sister Defonsa asked if it would be pertinent to bring chamomile tea. With all the commotion, the film with Gary Cooper was left unfinished, which was a source of a small venial disappointment for Monsignor Canali, because even though he wasn't fond of the genre, he had developed some empathy for Gary Cooper's travels, and wondered if the Rudy Cowboys, Cowboy, I'm sorry, would manage to save his ranch. He double-checked the temperamental alarm clock before he took his leave, as His Holiness was apparently already fast asleep his breathing softly ra raped by a pontifical snore. Monsignor Canali went to his cell, for even in the apostolic palace he had chosen austerity, and as he prepared for bed, setting his electric alarm clock to 5.45 in the morning, he still thought about Gary Cooper trying to convince Barbara Steinwick <laughs> that things would turn out well. It was not about money. It was their future at stake. But he knew, because he had watched enough westerns, that things would turn out fine. They always did in American films. He doesn't quite remember when he fell asleep, but when the urgent knocking on his door woke him up, the red numbers on his clock read 530. 
A wide-eyed sister Lefonsa opened her mouth a few times, as though the words refused to sound in her throat, before she finally said that His Holiness was not breathing, or rather, was breathing, but like someone buried alive. Part of the meaning might have been lost by the fact that Italian was not her tongue. Monsignor Canali asked her to calm down, telling her that His Holiness was always watched by God, and asked her to summon Dr. Scorza again. Monsignor Canali searched the corner of the pap papal bedroom for the hills, I'm sorry, reached the corner of the papal bedroom on the hills of Dr. Scorza, who was coming in a black silk dressing gown, a potential lack of decorum Monsignor Canali was willing to disregard, considering the urgency of the moment. In a matter of minutes, the quiet papal bedroom where Monsignor Canali had often heard the ding of a silver spoon on a teacup, words of wisdom spoken in a soft, albeit heavily accented Italian, and lately the clipped English of American films was filled with nurses and assistant doctor, the Swiss guards managing the pontifical stretcher, and Monsignor Pietro, who had arrived properly dressed in the official cassock, a holy Bible under his arm. Dr. Scorza changed his mind several times about moving His Holiness to the polyclinic, and when he finally ordered the move, His Holiness said in his fatherly Italian, Sto bene, è solo una indisposizione menore. In the midst of the confusion, and in spite of Dr. Scorza's last professional efforts, the pontifical heart stopped beating at 8.15 in the morning to the pain expression of Monsignor Pietro, who was unable to administer the holy confession. Monsignor Canali felt as though a powerful blow had been delivered to his chest. Had he been alone, he would have fallen to his knees, sobbing, for he loved his holiness as one loves a father. It was 8.18 when Monsignor Magnero, who assisted his holiness in the morning mass, walked in holding a tray with a small silver hammer which Monsignor Canali nor any of those present had seen before. Monsignor Canali took the shiny handle, perhaps polish in a hurry, because it didn't have the patina of silver, and after a long pause, which way gave everybody a chance to hold their breaths, gently tapped the pontifical forehead thrice, calling His Holiness by his birth name each time. Right after the last tap, which confirmed that the pontifical soul was no longer of this world, the temperamental alarm clock, mute so far, began ringing for the last time. Thank you, Jose. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. This is Benjamin Ali Designs, thanking Jose de Perola for being on the show. Thank you for saying, having me. Saying, until next week. Straighten up and stay right. Straighten up and fly right. Cool down, Papa, don't you blow your time.